You are listening to the Saturday Morning Cruise on the Beat 99.9 FM. My name is Sunshine. And I have a very, very important guest in the studio. Good morning. <laughs> this is her first time visiting Nigeria. And of course, she made it to the beat 99.9 FM. We have the American classical pianist and arts envoy, Pauline Yang. Welcome to Nigeria. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. I mean, uh, since you you came in, that, that was yesterday, right? Correct. Yes. So you haven't really had time to move around, have you now? Not quite yet. Uh, it's been a very busy schedule, a very great one. Uh, however, I've gotten to meet so many of the local uh, Lagosians here already and also had a chance to perform for many uh, last night. Oh, absolutely amazing. But you should... Take out some time to visit some of the beaches here. That would be nice too as well before you leave. That's <laughs> right. The beaches here are so famous. I would love to. I'm going to see if I could carve out some time. Probably in the evening. So after you're done with everything, you go to the beach and just relax a little bit. Even if it's for one hour. I'm looking at them with my side eye. Please <laughs> take her to the beach afterwards. <laughs> Good to know. I would love to check that out. Mm-hmm. Welcome, 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 welcome. So, I mean, let's talk about you because I find it very impressive that at age five, that was when, you know, you started training and when you started taking piano lessons professionally too as well. And by age eight, you had won an award and all of that. I mean, for you, was it one of those cases? Because I know when I was growing up, um, um, <laughs> people around me would say, oh, you talk too much. You should be a lawyer, you know, and they were just putting this idea of me becoming a lawyer in my head and all that, even though my talking too much landed me here <laughs> as a radio presenter. <laughs> But for you, I mean, at age five, was it um, a case of your guardian saying that, oh, I think she loves this. Let's harness this talent. Or how did that happen for you? Actually, in the East Asian community, at least in the area where I grew up in New Jersey, on the East Coast in the United States, it was very common, very typical for all uh, the children to learn an instrument. Oh, I Piano see. was the one choice. And then if they, at most, had a second choice, that would have been violin. Uh, so I grew up seeing and hearing my friends all playing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it actually was not all that extraordinary that I learned um, piano starting at the age of five. Uh, it seems from most of my travels around the world, even, that it seems that uh, five is about the average age. Mm -hmm. by which students start. But then the unfortunate thing is that most quit by 12 on average is what I've found. I think what ended up being different about me was the fact that I had such a phenomenal first teacher and that my parents did not push me. Okay. So I think it was this combination that made me realize how much I loved it. And that's why I ended up not quitting <laughs> by 12. What was your first teacher like? She was extremely encouraging. And very supportive, aside from being a great um, teacher at what was actually on the music mm -hmm. in conveying that. But she made me really love playing piano. So when it was time to practice every day, I looked forward to that. Ah. I specifically remember one afternoon uh, on a Saturday when I was five mm -hmm. and my family was going to go apple picking. <laughs> And I said, no, I can't go apple picking yet. Mom, I haven't finished practicing. What? <laughs> and so my teacher would assign me so many pieces because she taught me how to sight read very well, very fast early on. And so I was able to learn so many pieces and they were really great pieces that she assigned to me. So as a kid, I wanted to get better. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn faster. I wanted to be able to play even more pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I loved it. I, 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 I wish I was like that growing up because, okay, mine wasn't the piano, right? Mine was the keyboard. <laughs> so my dad at the time was like, oh, you need to learn one instrument and this one and that one. So he got some a keyboardist to come give us lessons, right? But <laughs> every time he would come around on a Sunday, me and my sister would go hide, would pick up excuses. <laughs> No, we don't want to do this. No, we don't want to. Do I feel like he just bought the keyboard and he just stayed there. It wasn't until one of my uncles came around that for the first time, I was so surprised when he was playing it. I did not know this thing could produce music. like, And it's been in this house since. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> well, yeah, that's really impressive. I mean, you started at, at a young age. You did so many different things. But at the same time, you were going to school as well. How were you able to cope with that? 
I mean, schooling and, you know, going about performing too as well? I was very lucky. I went to a public school system in New Jersey, K to 12, uh, from kindergarten all the way until 12th grade. And my teachers were so supportive. They were supportive of my uh, music endeavors, and they were really excited to know that one of their students was so serious mm-hmm. about pursuing uh, music that um, that this student would have to leave um, school sometimes for a week or two for concerts. And so they were extremely helpful in putting together all the assignments and study material that I would need when I would be gone. And my classmates, luckily for me, were very helpful as well. They were not the types who would uh, isolate me and Uh think, well, she's never here, so we're going to ignore her. Quite the contrary, they also wanted to be helpful and uh, they were really enthusiastic uh, about what I was doing. Mm Mm -hmm. which made it easier for me to uh, feel that I belonged and that I was um, appreciated uh, for all this other uh, work that I was doing outside of school. And also I ended up spending a lot of time with um, Olympic athletes uh, from even a young age. And so I saw that they too had to be gone. And so it really made me realize that if you want to become, um, uh, you want to get to the top of your field, you have to put in that kind of work and there are going to be sacrifices that are made. Was it so much work for you? I mean, I assume it will be, I mean, performing, touring, and at the same time, schoolwork, doing both of them together. It was absolutely a lot of work. Yes, no question about that. Um, And even later on in university, when I was doing a double major in both piano performance and political science, I remember one summer I was uh, doing a summer internship Uh and I needed uh, to find uh, housing that would not only be close enough to my internship, but where I would also have easy uh, access to a grand piano where I could <laughs> practice every evening after my internship because I was wow. going to go off to France and Brazil on tour um, after the conclusion of my internship. All right. So for someone who's listening right now who is trying to get into music, especially somebody who's young, who's probably still in secondary school and wants to do this thing as well. Is there anything, any advice, um, that something that you've learned from your experience growing up and pursue music and doing schoolwork as well that you can give to them that can help them stay on track? Yes, a lot, because a lot of my own mentors and teachers have guided me along this journey. And so a few things that I would say would be, one, surround yourselves with the best teachers and mentors that you can possibly find. They are going to be there for you throughout your life and career. And without them, we could not possibly get anywhere. Mm-hmm. They have been absolutely critical um, to, to me for my entire life and career, and I could not be more grateful. Another is to never forget why it is that you're doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Because it's only when you keep in mind constantly what your purpose is and why you're doing what you're doing that you'll push through the challenging moments, of which there will be many. And to also always love and respect what you do. This is a quote from Sylvie Guillem, one of my favorite ballet dancers of all time. And I could not emphasize enough just how how important it is that we always need to love and respect what we do. Yeah, true that. And I believe it actually does cut across everything, not just music as well. That's very valuable advice. I'm going to keep it for myself too as well. (laughs) (laughs) Great, great. Yeah. Okay. So obviously you've talked about how when you started off, it was a normal thing for children to learn an instrument and all that. Now for me, I had access, well, not to piano, but I had access to keyboard, but I didn't pick interest. But for you, what made it, I mean, I I assume there's equally some of your friends too as well who probably took piano lessons but didn't pursue it professionally. What was it that made you decide that, you know what, I'm going to do this professionally and this is what I'm going to do with my entire life? I've been very lucky. So ever since I was seven or eight years old, I had been getting concert opportunities. And that, I realize, is not so common. Mm -hmm. So I am grateful for that. I also feel, though, that because these opportunities came to me, I didn't really necessarily have to seek out um, engagements or concerts. And that's also a very lucky thing because that could be a very uh, stressful Stressful, process. Absolutely. And it wasn't necessarily a certain point at which I felt that I was going to um, focus only on music and to pursue this as my sole career. 
because throughout the years, I had always also been interested in academics,、mm-hmm. and I've always been intensely curious about everything outside of music as well, because I really feel that it takes a lot of curiosity to learn more about. Everything outside of one's field, in order to become better in、mm-hmm. that field,、yeah. and so I just tried to learn as much as I could, and then eventually, through my international concert travels,、uh, starting with Europe when I was eleven, I realized、uh, how much I loved international relations and getting to meet so many people in、uh, fascinating places. And、uh, since my concerts would take me to some countries that I might not necessarily have gotten to travel to, especially at so- such young ages, for example,、uh, when I was invited to、uh, Hungary、mm-hmm. to perform at the Grand Concert Hall at the Franz Liszt Academy of Music, I believe I was 13 at the time. And I also would like to believe that I would have made it to Hungary at some point in my life as a tourist, perhaps, but. I wouldn't have been able to have that opportunity, most likely at 13, if I hadn't、um, been so lucky with my、um, concert engagements. And so, through these concert travels, I realized that I wanted to also do some work in diplomacy,、mm-hmm. or at least to、um, do some、uh, formal education and then training. And I have loved it ever since. Speaking of education, I know that you are going to be doing some master classes. Let's get right into that. Okay, the master classes that you plan to hold here in Lagos, and I believe you're supposed to touch down Abuja and Ibadan as well. So take us through that. Yes, so I actually I just came from Abuja、uh, in the past few days, and there I had a chance to do a master class,、uh, for example, at the Strauss School of、mm-hmm. Music and Dance, and that was a great joy. There, not only did I get to see the young students in the、uh, primary school, but also got to work with some、um, adult pianists as well, and that was great fun. Yesterday at Musan, a beautiful facility, and also a Wonderful institution. I had the great honor of working with four current piano students there in the diploma program, and I was raving about them nonstop <laughs> to everyone at、um, both the embassy and the consulate here because I was so impressed. And it was such a joy to get to work with students who were so receptive to a constructive critique and who seemed eager. Enthusiastic and hungry to learn as much as they could in their short half an hour each、mm-hmm. with me, it was really a joy. During these master classes, like how does it go? What's the should I say? What's the what's the word now? I'm trying to figure it out. But basically, what's the master, what's a master class session like? Sure, I'll walk you through what it's uh, usually um, what the usual step by step procedure is. So usually, I like to have the student run through his or her piece. That、uh, that he or she prepared.、Uh, if it's too long a piece, I'll、uh, prepare them in advance where I will have them stop, and then I will then go on stage next to them, and then I'll first point out what I really enjoyed,、uh, what was really good about the performance and about the interpretation,、um, so that they know perhaps to keep that in mind,、uh, and then I'll point out a couple of suggestions, and I'll always. Back up the suggestions with reasons for why I think it should be like that.、Mm-hmm. Because, as one of my own teachers said to me before, every musical decision, every technical decision that we make for the pieces that we play, has to be informed and has to be、uh, defendable.、Uh, defensible. So,、uh, I always have to know why it is that I'm playing a certain note a certain way. And so I try to convey that to the students who I work with in the master classes. I, of course, also try to demonstrate a bit、uh, for the points that I'm trying to、um, get through. And then I also have the students try those corrections on the spot. And I understand fully that a lot of these corrections are not able to be made immediately、mm-hmm. because a lot of these、um, pointers will take <laughs> maybe not just days; it takes years. To work on. I mean, if we're talking about something like tone production, if we're talking about something like nuance in phrasing, in timing, that's not going to necessarily come right away. And it's also going to be something that they'll constantly have to keep in mind for other pieces as well. It's not just going to be 
um, critiques that will apply just to this one piece. And so I try to do a combination of technical corrections and interpretation slash uh, musical uh, suggestions. And then I always try to leave room for questions uh, if they um, have any questions either about what I said and or anything aside from what I was able to cover in that short amount of time. Wow, that sounds really intense in a short amount of time, honestly. But y- apart from the masterclasses, you are supposed to be performing live as well. And <laughs> what... I'm. As you're in Nigeria now, I'm just trying to picture this, right? You performing here in Nigeria. What should people look forward to? Should they look forward to probably um, you performing with some Nigerian artist or something like some sort of fusion, African fusion? What should people be looking forward to? Ah, fascinating. I hope that there may be a future opportunity for the fusion bit and the getting to collaborate with uh, Nigerian musicians. Uh, On this trip, the one chance that I did have to collaborate with um, a Nigerian musician was on my first night of arrival, actually. And I got to um, play just briefly with um, a local cellist uh, who is also teaching a lot of um, musicians here in Nigeria. So that was a great joy. And I've also um, been able to play um, a lot of uh, concerts now with the U.S. ambassador. And that is always an honor. Oh, with uh, Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard. I love her tremendously. I admire her tremendously. And every chance that I get um, to perform with her is not only an honor, but a real joy, too. Uh, So, so far, the concerts that I've been playing here have consisted of a mix of different uh, eras within the overall genre of Western classical music. And uh, my understanding is that classical music in Nigeria has not thus far been so popular. Yeah, I was going to ask that as well, mm-hmm. what the reception has been so far. I have been so pleasantly surprised. I really wasn't sure how audiences would receive it. Mm-hmm. And also if audiences may be bored. But uh, I have been so happy to find that they've been not only curious and interested in it from the reception that I, I uh, noticed uh, based on um, the ovations and the applause and uh, the cheers, but also from after the concerts, the level of uh, um, enthusiasm of everybody wanting to speak with me to ask me more questions about a particular piece, about a particular composer, about where they can learn more mm-hmm. about classical music. That has made me so happy because that's not necessarily a given Uh, Because I know that in uh, some other parts of the world, um, classical music, unfortunately, is uh, regarded as um, some even will call it um, dead music. And that hurts my heart to hear because it should not be. And uh, it depends on who's carrying it on. The legacy of the great composers who left us with the most amazing music. I'm still speechless when I have to try to describe this music because to me it's just uh, incredible that um, humans <laughs> humans were able to produce this kind of music and I worship these composers and so it is really not only my duty but also um, a true privilege to get to share this music with audiences especially in places where it has not been so easily accessed. Yeah, and just like you mentioned, there are certain people who feel like, oh, classical music is is not exactly their vibe. So, is, would you say it's financially lucrative? What's earning money like as a classical pianist? That depends on many factors. Uh, so, that depends on uh, recording contracts, although uh, these days there are not as many recording contracts as in um, past decades. Uh, this is attributable to uh, many reasons, partially because of the rise of social media, TikTok. being <laughs> right, right, sure, TikTok, Spotify. Um, um, iTunes. These are all great platforms too. Um, it's just that it's a different time. Mm-hmm. And so um, it used to be recording contracts. It used to be um, c- long concert tours. These days, of course, there are still tours. It's just not necessarily as long or as extensive as they used to be. Uh, so it could be a combination of recordings. It could be a combination of touring. Uh, of course, individual concerts as well. Um, or um, perhaps a concert series, which may not be as long as a tour or not geographically as widespread as a tour, but still a series of concerts. And so that's another way. But musicians are often, um, I should say performing musicians are also 
often doing a lot of teaching as well, if and when they are able to carve out the time, because of course students need the um, dedicated time as well. And so uh, teaching is part of it. And I think that is also a very important part because again, um, performers um, as musicians, we have to carry on that light, uh, that fire um, to the next generation, not only in terms of passion, but also in terms of the education that we received, mm-hmm. the training that we received from such fabulous teachers. We have to be able to pass that on to the next generation as well. Right. So I think it's a combination of factors. Of different things. It depends on how you're able to brand yourself, I believe. Well, okay then. Now, obviously, you've been in Nigeria. You've had master classes with some Nigerian students. So you definitely know for sure that there are people who are interested in this. What about if they decide to pursue it further and probably study music, say, abroad in U.S. colleges, um, just like you did? What would you? What advice would you give to them? What should they expect? I would absolutely encourage them to look into um, programs in the United States. I could not say enough about how lucky I feel to have done um, my um, post-secondary education in um, the States. I was at the University of Southern California uh, for uh, both um, my bachelor degrees in piano performance and political science, as well as for my first of two master's degrees, um, and that one was in piano performance. And one of the things that I feel most grateful for, for having um, done um, this education in the United States, is the possibility of doing a double major. This is really uncommon in other parts of the world, from what I've found in other countries. And so not only do you have such excellent teachers um, in uh, your instrument, or if you're a singer, then um, for voice, but aside from the great faculty also the great um, courses that are taught Mm -hmm. um, at universities, colleges, and conservatories. Uh, This has been a great gift. And then on top of that, to be able to pursue parallel uh, to the music studies, a separate field, if interested. And I certainly do encourage um, every musician to um, to do what you can to um, also study something else as well. Partially to diversify, but mostly to be able to make yourself as well-informed a musician as you can be and also as much of a global citizen as one can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's absolutely uh, critical. And the United States makes that possible. Okay, then. So when is your next event here in Lagos? My next event is going to be a private performance at the residence of the Consul General. Uh, And so I am very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I believe tomorrow morning I head off to Ivadan already. Mm -hmm. My time here in not only Lagos, but in Nigeria has been flying. I know. Just flying. And last night I had the opportunity to perform at uh, Terra Culture, which was a beautiful venue. Was that something that you were looking forward to um, when you were coming tonight? What are some of the things you were looking forward to coming into Nigeria, actually? I was really excited uh, right from the get-go to meet as many Nigerians as I could because um, I had met many in Washington, D.C. Uh, before, which is uh, my home base. But I wanted to see and meet Nigerians in Nigeria. And so that has been a great thrill. I had heard so much about the energy of the people here. Right. And I thought that when I would land in Abuja that I would be exhausted, <laughs> jet-lagged. It's a long trip. Um, to get here. I was actually traveling here from Taiwan, so even longer than from uh, Washington, D.C. So I was afraid that I would be just... (laughs) Tired. (laughs) Tired, exactly. But I found that the energy of the people who I met right from the get-go really have fueled me so much. And um, the Nigerians in Abuja were laughing because I was saying that uh, I found that there was already so much energy in Abuja. They said, wait until you land in Lagos. (laughs) (laughs) That's such a vibe. We party till 5 a.m. in the morning. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) that happens. But yeah, you were telling me just before um, we started talking how you were looking forward to seeing Danfo 
articles as well because you had read about them. Yes, that's right. I've uh, been reading Nu Sarawiwa's book, Looking for Trans Wonderland, mm-hmm. Travels in Nigeria, uh, which was recommended by uh, the ambassador. And oh, this is a fabulous book and what a fabulous writer too. But yes, so in it, there were so many very vivid scenes and specific images that uh, she writes about that I had been looking forward to seeing. So um, at first, I didn't know that Danfoss uh, were local to Lagos. I thought that this... Um, um, <laughs> You'd go to Abuja be... and see a Danfoss. Exactly. <laughs> yellow bus. Right. And so I was looking around uh, and uh, out the windows and not seeing any. And so I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> and so I asked um, embassy staff about uh, when I would get to see one. <laughs> and then I learned that they're everywhere in Lagos. And I thought, okay, well, I certainly hope that when I arrive in Lagos that I'll get to see one. <laughs> When I was on the road in Lagos, I realized they're everywhere. So uh, I realized that there was nothing to worry about. I would get to see a Dampo. <laughs> I was very excited. That is hilarious. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so who is your favorite Nigerian musician or which Nigerian musician do you like? So I've been very excited to learn about Burner Boy. Hey. I'm excited because so many people have mentioned him in both cities now. Really? Yes. So I feel that I um, will become a quick fan. <laughs> All right. I'm about to play you one of his songs. Fantastic. I will, I will do that in a moment. But really, it's just been a pleasure having you. Is there anything else you'd like to add um, before we let you go? Because I know that you have a very, very busy day ahead of you. I just wanted to thank on both the U.S. mission in Nigeria and the U.S. Department of State for having me um, here because this is truly a dream come true. The culmination of my uh, piano and diplomacy perf- uh, passions and dreams, both professionally and personally, have been uh, through these public diplomacy visits and I am truly living the dream. So I would like to thank uh, the United States for that. I would also very much like to thank the Nigerian people though for uh, welcoming me so warmly. I was mentioning to the ambassador how nice it has been to notice that the Nigerians are so quick to smile (laughs) whether just in passing or in conversation and I have just loved every minute of being here and I attribute that to the people Everything comes down to people to people relations, and I have been most warmly welcomed. So I thank everybody here so much. And we thank you too for coming. Are you on social media? What I are, am. What are your social media handles? So my uh, Instagram handle is Diplo Piano. Diplo as in diplomacy, mm-hmm. and then piano. Diplo Piano, one word. So absolutely find me on there, and I would be happy to engage more. All right then. And you know what I'm looking forward to? You and maybe, I'm just picturing in my head, probably a live concert. I don't know how you people are going to mix it and fuse it together. You and Burner Boy. <laughs> you on the piano. Burner performing live. Probably, I, I don't know, a classical live rendition of one of his. I don't know how you people are going to do it, but that would be nice to see. All right? That so would I'm, be fascinating. Yes, I'm going to play you his single with Kid. That is another artist you should look out for as well. I've heard. <laughs> yes. All right, then. Thank you so much for coming. You are listening to the Beat 99.9 FM. My name is Sunshine. And of course, I've been chatting with the American classical pianist and art envoy, Pauline Yang. Thank you so much, Pauline, for coming through. The Beat 99.9 FM. What your radio craves.